You're listening to PetLifeRadio.com. It's 11 o'clock at night. It's dark. You're sitting in front of the mirror getting ready for bed. There's nobody else in the house. You see something move in the corner of your eye. You glance to your right, but you don't see anything. Another minute goes by, and you think you see movement again. So you slowly turn to your left, but again, the room is empty. You turn back around, and staring you face to face in the mirror is a cat. You jump back, because you don't have a cat, and there's no cat in the room. But there he is, staring at you in the mirror. Welcome to Paranormal Pets, where you can always expect the unexpected. Each week, we'll discuss all aspects of weird or spiritual animal encounters, ghosts, totems, psychic animals, animal souls, animal angels, and animals in religion, with a little cryptozoology thrown in. Now, step into the supernatural world of pets with your Paranormal Pets ghostly host, Brandy Stark. Hello, and welcome to Paranormal Pets. I am your host, Brandy Stark, and we are doing a little bit of a catch-up potpourri episode in preparation for, most likely, our last Paranormal Pugs investigation for 2016. So, when we get back, we'll deal with a couple of articles, a couple of submissions, and a couple of updates, and then hopefully I'll have some time to prepare you for the information for our last pug investigation for 2016. So we will get started with that right after these messages. Now time for something really scary. A word from our sponsors. Paranormal pets will reappear before you can say Bigfoot. Don't run away. It's designerpetsweaters.com. Hand-knitted designer sweaters for your precious pup or cool cat. Beautiful couture patterns for your pets, including custom-knitted formal wear, casual wear, yachting, and even sports-themed. Many designer pet sweaters include feathered tammy hats, top hats, and a lot of sparkle. Each sweater includes leg loops, front paw sleeves, and leash opening. Visit designerpetsweaters.com to order your four-legged fashions today. Your pets will stay warm for the winter and be runway ready. Large or small, we fit them all. Designerpetsweaters.com Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com Did you hear that? Our commercials have mysteriously disappeared. Paranormal Pets is back with our haunted host, our ghost host, Brandy Stark. And welcome back to Paranormal Pets. Oh, what a year it's been. So there are quite a few things that have happened starting in October. One of the first was the uh, library presentation that they're not all out to get you. The friendly ghosts from around the world. And it was a very synoptic view, but I had to go through quite a few cultures. Uh, I presented this at the Gibbs Campus Public Library in St. Petersburg, and it was a lot of fun. One aspect that was rather unique is that afterwards, I did have a woman who came up to me, and she said that just a few days before, she had put her 15-year-old dog to sleep, and that night when she had come home, she was lying in bed, and she looked up, and she saw the dog standing in the doorway, and then it just kind of vanished. She was really very upset. She was hoping that the dog didn't feel betrayed by her, And I know I I answered her and I said it was okay that pets are usually much more comfortable with death than we are. And what I wish I had also added is that I think that the little dog appeared to her after 15 years. I think it's significant because I think it found its way home. So it was checking in on her, making sure she was okay, and was preparing to probably cross over. As of that point, she hadn't seen the little guy again. But it was a really interesting story to hear. And it was kind of unexpected. So, but it's interesting when that happens, when those pets show up and they say, hey, we're still here, just checking on you, heading out. 
So uh, that was kind of a nice real life event. We actually did do the tour of the Suntan Art Center. I finally got that little book published. Uh, it's called Spectral Musings. If you are interested, it is on Amazon. It's 99 cents through the Kindle. And I think it's like $3.95 for the published book. I found one typo in it, so I'm probably going to fix that and resubmit it again. But it does support St. Petersburg Paranormal Investigation. And uh, if you'd like to get a copy, please do. I don't want to dissuade anyone from getting it. So I think if you have some sort of Kindle program, you can also download it for free. But please try to support the group. <laughs> it would be wonderful. It's our first book. And this thing was something else to make, let me tell you. Uh, if it could go wrong, it did. I mean, that has been all of 2016, I'm pretty sure. Just kind of this ginormous stumbling block. <laughs> but that's okay. We did it. We made it. Uh, it's really exciting to see this little booklet in hard copy. And uh, I'm looking forward to expanding it. I'm thinking of either adding like a location per year, seeing about some of the older cases and what I can revamp from those and maybe putting those in or other published material that I've already done. Of course, I have to check on copyright and all that. So, you know, kind of, uh, you know, a nice big project, but we'll get to it. Other aspects of 2016, as a personal side note, this has been very interesting. I was being a rather facetious artist because for many years I have submitted my art, particularly my hand-wrapped wire metal sculptures, to many, 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 many art shows. And I'm, I'm actually not kidding on that. When I print out the list of art shows, which is unfortunately incomplete because I'm hit or miss with them, it's something like 17 pages of text. So that's a lot of shows over 20 years. And I've, uh, I've been rather disheartened because the metal is oftentimes overlooked, particularly in a mixed show. Uh, it's almost always painting that gets the award. And I have felt for many, many years that there has been a 3D bias. So I thought, okay, I'm going to do photography. I'm just going to see what happens if I do some pictures. And my photography is also hit or miss. I take many pictures. Some of them are very unusual. I have an idea in mind. It's partially chance. I'm just in the right spot at the right time. Uh, it's taking that opportunity and taking the photo. But I had some of a flamingo from Sunken Gardens. It was one of two elder flamingos that they had. And uh, the, they just got young ones. So they have a flock. And I have not seen this flock yet. It's on my list of things to do, hopefully, over the winter break. But much to my surprise, the first time I showed the piece, it got honorable mention. And then it got a merit award. Then it got accepted to an open call for artists at Amelie Arena. There were four, over 400 entries because it was an open call and they accepted 41 pieces and mine was one of the 41. So I about passed out. I think I called my mother and one of my friends and I <laughs> just, like I said, I almost fainted. It, it was just so overwhelming because again, the medal I have submitted to the same open call for years and not gotten anywhere with it. The good news is I see why the metal didn't get in because it's simply too small for the space. So now that I have an idea of the spatial dimensions, that gives me a much better idea of what they might be looking for. And I would have to do some really big, much flatter wire sculpture. But that was, that was shocking. My wire sculpture did take a step forward because it got accepted through jury for the Dali Museum. I will be showing December 7th at the 12 Nights of Dali, which I believe it's a members event, but I was one of the selective creatives. I believe there were 10 or 12. I think there were 12 of us selected. So that was a shock. I did a, a photograph of Shiva Nataraja. So Shiva is the, the Lord of the Dance. It's gotten honorable mention. I did a second shot of the flamingo. This was an awesome flamingo. And uh, the first shot uh, was actually the flamingo from almost above. I, I can't even remember how I got this angle. It was legal. I did not cross any lines, but it was just really dead on. And it was a great shot. And what it actually did was it made the flamingo into uh, abstracted shapes and colors, essentially. The second shot, the bird kind of turned its head to look at me like, what are you doing, lady? And I got that picture. And so I've started circulating that one. And so far, it's gotten also a merit award. I took a photograph at the Florida Aquarium down in Tampa, I submitted it. It got third place in a scape show. So I, I don't know what to do with this <laughs> right now. It's been very overwhelming. I've been an artist for 20 years. I've had some small success but never anything quite like this. And I, I'm at kind of this odd crossroads personally because my heart is with the wire. It always has been, but I have spent most of my adult life, uh, I've done art since I was 19, I believe, arguing that the wire is not a craft. There are people that will look down at it and call it a craft. And I argue that because of Alexander Calder, who was a 
the artist who really invented the mobile, if you will, as art. Calder also did paintings. Uh, he was kind of a surrealist around the time of Dali, but he also did wire sculpture. And so I've often argued that, you know, based on this artist who was well known and his pieces were well known, that the wire is an art. My heart remains with the wire, but much to my surprise, the awards are coming from the photography. So I'm, I guess I'm trying to figure out what to do. I'm delighted, absolutely. But I just have to figure what to do with the wire, where I can take this to get it to the next level and to get it accepted a little bit more. Yes, that's the next bit of news. So in addition to all of this, the Stark household has a new member about two weeks ago, I had an email from a friend who knows that I do pug rescue, and uh, she said that she had a friend who had a puggle that needed a home, and I remembered that my mother was interested in a puggle. Turns out she was interested in a chug. Hmm. So anyway, I said, yes, we take this puggle, and in fact, I saw a photograph of her, and as soon as I saw it, I'm like, oh, I'll call her Penelope. I can call her Penny for short. If you're not aware, a puggle is a pug-beagle mix. They are more beagle looking, particularly this one, but they have the flatter face, they have the black snout, uh, they have kind of the eye mask. The ears are a little droopier and more pug shaped, but they're big like a beagle, not as big, but they're in that range. They have the curl tail, and many of them that you look up, they're red in color, and she's red. So I thought I can call her Penelope and then Penny for short, because this does this. One, I name most of the pugs that I raise for Greek characters from the Iliad or Odyssey. So I had my first official adult pair were or the, that I raised when I was uh, a young adult, Odyssey and Iliad. As they grew older, I got Odysseus and Achilles. Then I ended up with Patroclus. Pandora was a surprise because I could have done better with the naming there, but Pandora, nice Greek myth uh, because she was the first woman, uh, according to the Greeks. So I thought, since I have Odysseus and Achilles, I will name her Penelope. Penelope is the wife of Odysseus, uh, the long-suffering wife of Odysseus. And so, you know, this will work out. Well, as we're driving across the bridge to go and get this puggle that I'm thinking, my, you know, we'll choose between two of us or my mom's still interested. Mom says, oh, well, she'll outlive me anyway and you'll inherit her, so you might as well raise her. Okay, <laughs> so I now have a puggle. She's eight months old. Apparently, these people found her with a breeder or in a center that might have been kind of questionable at six months, and they were afraid that she'd be sent back. And if you're not familiar, some of these puppy mill places or places that sell puppy mill pets, they send them back if they're not sold by six months. So uh, they got her. They got her shots, and they got her neutered, and she's eight months old when I got her. They had her only for a month, but were preparing to move to a smaller place, had other pets, had children. It was just a bit much. So Penelope is now here, and I'm trying to adjust to having a snouted pet again. Her pug half is certainly there. You should see her eat. She's very friendly. She wants you to be happy. The beagle, very intelligent and very happy-go-lucky. I mean, nothing really seems to deter her or upset her whatsoever. Pugs are moody, but that's been interesting. I will tell you that the first night she was here, the pugs were very, very unhappy, and I awoke to find all of them sleeping with their butts towards me. Okay, the one that has been the most unhappy is, or the unhappiest, is Pandora, who is the queen here. So it's, uh, it's been an interesting period of adjustment. In the meantime, Achilles and Odysseus have had their 11th birthdays. They are now, as of November, 11-year-old gentlemen. I'm not sure how much longer I'll be taking them out as paranormal pugs. They still have the energy, but they are starting to kind of slow down and get a little rounder as, you know, so am I. So I guess that happens. So I have to figure what to do for the next generation of paranormal pugs. Pandora and Grace are both six. They are sisters. One's black, one's fawn. But I'm not sure how well they do with the traveling. They, they are a little more high strung. Patroclus I'm not sure he's sensitive whatsoever. I, he might be. I just don't know. Penelope would be interesting. I'd be curious to see how the beagle pug mix works together, but we'll see on that. And, uh, you know, it's just going to be an interesting time. So they are heading with me out to Safety Harbor today, however, so no worries on that. Anyway, what we'll do is we'll go ahead and take our break. And when we get back, I will tell you a couple more developments and we'll go over a couple of animal stories that we've gotten and I'll get ready to tell you about Safety Harbor, then I have to get ready to go.
to Safety Harbor. <laughs> so take it easy, and we'll be right back after these messages. Now, time for something really scary. A word from our sponsors. Paranormal pets will reappear before you can say Bigfoot. Don't run away. My Golden Retriever Sundance is a lot more playful now. She has more pep and energy. Tons of energy. Happy the rescue dog is happy the healthy dog. Petey is having fun again. He's got a shiny coat and a good healthy weight. Molly's been having four scoops a day. She pushes her little bowl all the way across the room, emptying every last single crumb. She has slimmed down and gotten this puppy look. She's got life. She's got energy. We get asked all the time when we're at shows, how do you get your dog so healthy and shiny and glossy? D-I-N-O-V-I-T-E dot com. 859-428-1000. The omega-3 fatty acids. Flaxseed, zinc, alfalfa. The digestive enzymes that are cooked out of regular dog food. Dynavite is nutrition. Just feed your dog right. Do the Dynavite. 859-428-1000. 859-428-1000. Dynavite for life. D I N O. V-I-T-E dot com. Hi, I'm Dana Humphrey, the founder of Whitegate PR. We have been specializing in PR and marketing in the pet industry for over 10 years. If you have a pet product or service you would like to promote, give us a call. We can help create awareness for your brand on TV, radio, magazines, newspapers, and blogs. Feel free to reach me directly at 619-414-9307 or learn more on our website at whitegatepr.com or follow us on Facebook. Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. Dot com. Did you hear that? Our commercials have mysteriously disappeared. Paranormal Pets is back with our haunted host, our ghost host, Brandy Stark. And welcome back to Paranormal Pets. We are going to finish this uh, wrap-up update and get into some of the nitty-gritty in preparation for a paranormal pet excursion today. The next thing that is somewhat new, I, boy, I need to update these things more often, don't I? If you are curious, I actually had an email through my art page asking why we did not have a paranormal pets Facebook page. So to solve that issue, we now have a paranormal pets Facebook page. It is www.facebook.com paranormal pets and you'll recognize it with the banner that is similar to what we have on the website. Feel free to communicate with us there. We'd love to hear from you. I've started to kind of build it. I think it's almost up to 200 followers, so it's been a little bit slow, but it's very exciting. And this page actually brought me the next paranormal pet story that I have, and that is submitted through messages. The person said I could share it, but mentioned no names, which is fine. But it goes something like this. Hi there, we bought an older home about six and a half years ago. At the time, we had one cat of our own. From the very beginning, I knew there was a pet other than my own present. And that is the puggle, by the way, in the background. I apologize. I imagine or maybe sense that there is a cat or small dog from the sound of its footsteps and space it seems to take up at our bed. When my cat came up to bed at night, I would hear the other animal following along on our hardwood floors. My cat would sleep up near my head, but I would feel the heat of another animal curled up against my legs. We got a second cat after moving in, and now it seems like we have three pets, two living and one not. I continue to sense and hear this creature six and a half years later, as it likes to follow the same routines as my living cats. What I don't understand and I'm looking for some insight into is this. Why would a pet stay around after its owners have moved on and then attach itself to humans and other animals that it did not know when it was alive? So my answer to this, I think there are a couple of reasons for your experience. If it's a cat, then perhaps the animal is showing the traits of the species. While canines become attached to packs and people, thus traveling is less difficult on them, felines are very territorial. They become attached to locations, and moving and travel is difficult for them. If it is a cat, then perhaps they are showing an exceptional trait of attachment to territory. A second case might be if it's a canine. 
Here I point out a few odd stories like Greyfriar Bobby, in which a dog is so loyal to a person that even in death it doesn't break its bond. If the prior owner died away from home or died unexpectedly, perhaps the dog is waiting for them to come home. While the human might have crossed over, the disconnect between the two of them might have been great enough that the dog didn't know. Or the separation of one from the other might have been so fast that there wasn't time to register the death. I'm also curious if the animal died in its sleep. Perhaps unexpectedly, a massive stroke or heart attack might have taken the animal while it was asleep. It might not be fully aware that it's deceased. Just for something to think about, I remember reading a couple of articles through my lifetime that there is a form of heart issue with humans where the first major symptom listed is death. When I was in my early 30s, I read about a local marathon runner of wonderful shape, exercised great health, who just dropped dead while finishing a local marathon. It was eerie because he was my age and he was diagnosed at autopsy with this issue. In the meantime, if your cat was okay with it, and I guess the cats presently are okay with it, then the animal spirit was likely an earthbound entity confused on its status. Perhaps it mistook you for the owner it was waiting for or as new owners. I asked for permission to use this story. And then the other thing I suggested, in Florida, they tent for termites. The tenting process is often fairly unhealthy to any living creature in the area. You might check to see if the prior owners did any form of tenting and if perhaps an animal got caught in the process. It's a sad thought, but something that does happen and may also explain some of the cat or ghost confusion or reluctance to leave. So if this animal died unexpectedly and suddenly, uh, it might be haunting the location. So we'll see what the follow-up is to this story, but I was delighted to have the opportunity for folks to have a new place to share with me. And I will be posting this on my own Paranormal Pets page fairly soon. In addition to that, uh, a couple of articles came out. One in July of 2016. It's a good thing I'm doing this now. This was in the perspective section of the Tampa Bay Times, and it's called Waddling Towards Recognition. It pervades our thinking process from situations as simple as choosing which socks to wear to more nuanced scenarios like knowing to laugh during a wedding toast but not at a funeral. The ability to make inferences from same and different, once thought unique to humans, is present in creatures generally seen as unintelligent, newborn ducklings according to a study published in Science. First, the research took day-old ducklings and exposed them to a pair of moving objects. The objects were then were the same or different in shape or color. When they exposed each duckling to two entirely new pairs of moving objects, the researchers found that about 70% of the ducklings preferred to move toward the pair of objects that had the same shape or color relationship as the first objects they saw. It's clear from this and other research that animals process and appreciate far more of the intricacies in their world than we've ever understood, said Edward Wasserman an experimental psychologist at the University of Iowa who reviewed the study. So once again, we have this notion that animals are more aware of their surroundings than we have given them credit for. The next article is Dogs Know What You Said. Uh, this is also from the Tampa Bay Times section, and I don't have a date on it. This is a, a reprint, I believe, from the New York Times. Who's a good dog? Well, that depends on whom you are asking, of course, but new research suggests that the next time you look at your pup, whether Maltese or Mastiff, you might want to choose your words carefully. Both what we say and how we say it matters to dogs, said Attila Andix, a research fellow at the Etfos Lorand University in Budapest. Andix, who studied language and behavior in dogs and humans, along with Adam Milowski and several other colleagues, reported in a paper published in the Journal of Science that different parts of dogs' brains respond to the meaning of the word and how the word is said, much as human brains do. As with people's brains, parts of dogs' left hemisphere react to meaning and parts of the right hemisphere to intonation, the emotional content of a sound. And perhaps the most interesting to dog owners, only a word of praise said in a positive tone really made the reward system of a dog's brain light up. A trainer spoke words in Hungarian, common words of praise used by dog owners like good boy, super, and well done. The trainer also tried neutral words like however and nevertheless. Both the praise words and the neutral words were offered in positive and neutral tones. The positive words spoken in a positive tone prompted the strong activity in the brain's reward centers. All of the other conditions resulted in significantly less action and all at the same level. In other words, good boy said in a neutral tone and however said in a positive or neutral tone all got the same response. What does it mean? 
For dog owners, Andix said, the findings mean that dogs are paying attention to meaning and that you should too. In terms of evolution of language, the results suggest that the capacity to process meaning and emotion in different parts of the brain and tie them together is not uniquely human. This ability has already evolved in non-primates long before humans began to talk. So once again, I think this is a pretty good indicator that humans and animals have kind of a, a unique intelligence. And if humans can process ghosts, I think animals can too. This becomes a, a wonderful question. And in fact, I asked this to a class one day during a break, not during the lecture. But if a ghost manifests, does it have to have a receiver? And the next question for this particular genre would be, if a ghost manifests, does it have to have a receiver, and does that receiver have to be human? So can a ghost manifest without a human present? Can a ghost manifest without any living creature present? So it kind of becomes a, a unique thought process. Oh, okay, for our last piece of potpourri so that I can kind of get us going, the next episode we'll deal with this a little bit more, but we are going to take the pugs to the Haunted Mound at Philippi Park in Safety Harbor. This we've investigated before. Uh, I think the pugs came with this, but this was before the podcast, I believe. The original case is located on the Urban Legends of Florida site, which by the way also made the newspapers around Halloween because of our mini lights page. I was really excited for that. I mean, Halloween was a really interesting time. So the original entry, I first heard about the urban legend in the late 1990s. I worked for a company that had an office in Safety Harbor. One afternoon we had a picnic planned and I was told that the Native American Midden in the park was haunted. I brought my ELF meter, a low frequency EMF meter, and walked the Midden and nothing happened. I asked for more information and was told that the mound was haunted by either the shaman priest or the chief of the Tokabaga tribe that had lived there before. He was seen ascending the mound at certain times and I believe he was associated with the direction of the West. I put out a call for stories on the mound and none were submitted. In a conversation the weekend of the investigation, I did have confirmation from one person who told me that she had heard the mound was haunted. She also said that she had heard from another person really into the metaphysical that Pinellas and or the Tampa Bay area was protected from hurricanes because of the Native American burial sites. And this was back in 2014. On February 9th, 2014, the spirits of St. Petersburg set out to investigate. And this included the following. The mound by Pavilion 7. Research revealed two legends as associated with the area. The first was that the Native American haunted this mound. The second involved Odette Philippi, the first non-native settler to the region. He established a plantation in the area in 1821. He was buried sometime in the park area, theoretically near the homestead, but his grave has never been found. There was a suicide that took place in the park in 2009. Researchers found this bench for the investigators to study. Philippi Park was acquired in 1948, making it the oldest park in the county. This historically rich park bears the name of Count Odette Philippi, who introduced citrus culture to Florida. The existing park property was part of the original Philippi plantation from which several citrus trees still remain. Odette Philippi was the first permanent non-native settler on the Pinellas County Peninsula who acquired 160 acres of land in what is today Safety Harbor and he bought these in 1842. He was a successful businessman who introduced cigar making and citrus to Tampa Bay. His descendants, including the McMullen and Booth families, are among the county's most well-known pioneer clans. Philippi was buried in the park his former plantation at the time uh, in 1869, but the exact location of the grave site is not known, and the actual grave site is known as a memorial only. So we are going to take the paranormal pugs, and actually I guess the last time I investigated, though I expected to get little response on our equipment, I was surprised to discover areas of EMF. When we first arrived at the mound, I noted that the EM was a zero, a perfectly flat on the tri-field meter, Odysseus and Achilles showed no fear of the location, so they were there before. My initial questions were unanswered and elicited no response. And on the third attempt, is anyone here, I did get a spike. The meter spiked several other times when I asked questions, are you the Native American? Are you Odette? But the consistency of the answers was not there. When the questions were repeated for confirmation, I would not get spikes. I did verify that my phone and camera were turned off at the time. 
Issues with the park did include the wonderful afternoon weather, there were people present and while not overly crowded, there were enough to keep us from doing recordings of EVPs. The pugs enjoyed themselves but seemed to have found little of either extreme interest or diversion. When we got to the bench area, I again attempted EMF readings. I did get some spikes despite an otherwise flat reading. Questions again did not get a consistent answer. Photographic evidence was also not compelling, though I did get several nice images. And that is the background. So on the next episode of Paranormal Pets, we will see live action, how everything goes. And you'll get that in our next episode. So until then, happy haunting. Click one over and hopefully you will get the results of our live action investigation. Thank you for listening. Remember to support Rescue. And if you'd like to see more on any form of the paranormal, you can check out my website at www.spipinellas.net. And that is P-I-N-E-L-L-A-S dot net. Thank you so much. And I got to go check and see what the Puggle's doing. See you next episode. Pet Life Radio presents... Paranormal Pets, where you can always expect the unexpected. Each week we'll discuss all aspects of weird or spiritual animal encounters, ghosts, totems, psychic animals, animal souls, animal angels, and animals in religion, with a little cryptozoology thrown in. Step into the supernatural world of pets every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com.